Hello, good morning, and welcome to our live talk program. This is Lloyd Gov here, your host on Revive Reform Radio, doing our live talk program covering natural health on your Wednesday morning rise and shine. Natural health is what we're looking at here this morning as we look at the topic suicide and depression effect of the culture. It's an effect of the culture. And so this is what we're looking at here this morning as we do our live talk program. So welcome, top of the morning to you. Hopefully at a blessed night rest and you're ready to take on today. Um, let us begin with a prayer. Our Father, Lord, in heaven, we thank thee again for your word. We thank you for the reliability of your word. And we pray, O oh Lord, that you may be with us as we contemplate these um, thoughts here and these um, reality, this reality that we have around us. May you bless us, we pray. And May you continue to guide us in all that we do and say. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're looking at this topic here, um, which is suicide um, and depression effects, effects of the, the culture, effect of the culture. That um, the culture push on certain things and it is viewed... Um, uh, as as just part of how we live, you know, it's accepted that this is the culture. But it, often um, in any culture, because that's the reality that everybody has around them, one can um, um, just accept it as um, this is normal and th there's nothing wrong with this. And as this happens, then it, it becomes more ingrained, I should say, um, in the culture. And... That's not a good thing. And so um, I believe this is what we're seeing here in the suicide rate, you know, as they reported that the suicide rate um, has increased in the United States um, from 1999 to 30%. And it's, there are more people now dying because of suicide <clears throat> than because of um, uh, say car accidents and stuff like that. So as, um, we see this happening and we interact um, with the culture, it, it is obviously that this is a cause and effect thing. Um, the culture pushes on um, this idea here that, uh, you know, you have to live a certain lifestyle, you have to be a certain way, and this is normal to the culture. And um, everybody must accept and be part of that reality if you don't live according that way then you're not true um but if you're true to that culture in a true sense it can be very depressing and suicidal now i'll start off by reading um my main text here is in proverbs 26 verse 2 proverbs 26 verse 2 say as the bird by wandering and as the swallow by flying so the curse causeless shall not come so as a bird by wandering so if you're here um, in the Northeast, uh, and it's summertime, and you see certain migratory birds, um, they got here by a certain way. They got here by flying. And then if you go in the wintertime, you see them in Florida or Central America, they got there by a certain way. Things that just happen, there's a cause and effect. And um, when you see the effect, um, you have to try to figure out what's the cause. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to be exploring what I think is the cause. And I'm sure um, I'm going to read in uh, one opinion piece here. It's an opinion. And it's just my um, way narrowly of looking at an opinion of, of a trend in the society. And I'm sure you're, you've been looking at it because everybody been looking at it and talking about it. And you can't avoid because of all the suicides. Uh, you can avoid dealing with it because of all the suicides and uh, if it's not somebody close to you, somebody that you know, and somebody close to them. So, um, as the bird by wandering and as the swallow by flying, so the curse causeless shall not come. You know, you could see a plant growing and you're like, wow, how did that plant got there? And you realize the, the bird brought it there. Bird ate the seed, then passed the seed out whole and then planted the seed with manure. And a seed grub and bring a beautiful tree. And you're like, wow, nobody planted that tree, but that tree got there. But it doesn't get there by that. Things just doesn't happen like that. It might be hard to understand how it got to that level. And somebody might say, this is just our culture. But you say, was the culture always like that? And then you start to realize that the bird doesn't get there just so. It is a cause and effect. There's a, uh, you've seen the effect, 
but often we sometimes don't look at the cause or we assume that you can't change anything because that's normal it is it is um nature not nurture and this has been something that if you listen to me here i talk a lot about because when you say something is nature then it's almost like you're saying it's not changeable but when you say it's nurture then you say well that's possibly something that can be changed so culture are things that to me are nurture they're not nature it's not innate you know if you if you're from india it's not a requirement that you must eat food that's hot and uh, has over 250000 you know heat units and above it's that's not you know nature it's not like okay if the person is indian don't eat food that is that hot then they're going to die somewhere somehow uh, it might be that they will die by keep eating the hot food but somebody could say that's just part of my culture and i could say yeah that's your right it's part of your culture and if it's killing you and you're dying from stomach cancers and stuff then probably you need to start contemplating doing something to change that because that's not as i say that's not nature that's just the way you've been nurtured in behaving and i think when we talk about suicide and depression in the society we're not talking about something that is about nature we're talking about something that is just part of the culture it is just the end result of how the culture function people um has it of a bad, badge of honor to isolate themselves and to be by themselves and not to deal with others because they're good uh, that's normal people say you you need to help there man oh no i'm good are uh, you hi they just look at you like what why are you looking at me like that don't say hi to me so i'm like okay and then the person next to you know kill himself i used to say, well isolation is a terrible thing so i'm gonna read two quest um two um passages two articles here on this issue one is uh, uh just a uh, uh some information about suicide and uh, the first one and the second one is going to be an opinion piece about what's going on in our society now how can we help prevent suicide ask listen doctors say people may fear that talking about it will trigger an attempt but it is it's the right thing to do experts say so this morning i'm doing the right thing as i often do you know mental health is something that i talk about a lot here because i really believe that a lot of people their actions are because of their mental state as i say i believe this is this the um i'm talking here now this is not the article so this is the um part of the culture you know a lot of what we see in the culture where people are very reckless people take opiates and other drugs it's because of um, depression the loneliness the isolation um, the suicide obviously depression obviously um, overeating that can be pushed on by depressed the person get used to eating comfort foods that's what makes them happy and you can see a lot of things in the society that you know a lot of this, you know you see almost all the suicide um, murder suicide a lot of the mass shooters they're very depressed individual individuals and so you look at it and somebody's saying, well, what's happening is the, the culture. The culture is a culture that creates a lot of depressed suicide people. And the results are multiple. And But most people don't connect them. They just say, well, if you murder yourself or suicide yourself, then that's because of suicide, you know, depression. But a lot more things that goes on in society is just because people are very suicidal or very depressed because of what the culture does so this is again an article that is written by um, maggie fox over there at nbc news suicide have reached a record high in the united states and deaths of two beloved celebrity fashion designer kate spade and celebrity chef anthony bourdain have left um, people wondering how to help a friend who might be in crisis even as psychiatrists and public health specialists uh, struggle to explain the growing numbers people who have survived their own suicide attempts say there are things that ordinary people can do to help someone they know who might be at risk of suicide ask and listen is the suggestion um, being asked is such a relief says Emmett Oden 
an 18-year-old suicide attempt survivor in Nashville. Quote, listening to someone is more Im mo the most important part, agrees uh, Desiree Stage, a suicide attempt survivor and activist who photographs and tells the stories of suicide survivors as part of a live through this project. Suicide may still be considered a sin in many communities, and people may fear that they will somehow put the idea into someone's head. These fears can be magnified by warnings about copycat suicide after celebrity deaths. And I'll pause there again to say that the suicide hotlines reported an uptick in incoming calls. Back to the article here, it says, But it is not only safe to ask, it is the right thing to do says Dr. Jack Rosell, Medical Director of Allegheny Crisis Service Facility in Pittsburgh and President-elect of the American Association of Emergency Psychiatry. It's absolutely okay to ask someone you are concerned about if they're having suicidal thoughts, Rosell um, said. You won't magnify this idea. If they say yes, stay with them. But don't offer advice and try to cheer people up. Stage advice. You can tell people all day long that they have this future and they can see it, she says. A suicide Hotline now offers an instant access to help, not only for people who struggle with thoughts of dying, but for those who care about them. There is something that everybody can do. You can help save lives, CDC Principal Deputy Director Dr. Ann uh, Sh Shotkat. Um, if you are looking for help uh, or worried about a loved one in crisis, please call National Suicide Prevention Hotline 1-800-273-8255. Just this week, the CDC reported that 45,000 people died of suicide in 2016 and U.S. suicide have risen by 30% since 1999. It becomes clear that while depression is a major risk factor for suicide, it is the, it is, it's not the only factor. Many people who died by suicide have been struggling with relationship or financial problem so i just pause there so depression is a cause but they say many people are struggling with relationship now now that's fascinating uh to me because that's down the line i'm going uh, and why is that because uh th this is what the expert is saying this is what i, I don't know what i'm saying next is what i observe because if i'm talking to you and i'm trying to talk to you or try to be a friend to you and you just you just there's a wall and then us as human beings we are created to be social creatures we are so created to be social creatures when you read genesis and it says adam was in a perfect garden with animals so that means Adam adam have thousands probably of pets um, thousands of trees, foods, everything perfect, weather perfect, everything perfect. But Adam was lonely. And that tells you the level of social creatures we are. And I know a big part of our society believe that they evolve. But whether or not they believe that they evolve doesn't change the reality. We are social creatures. And so here we have a society that um, almost prides itself on isolation and unfriendliness. So if you if a person prides themselves on unfriendliness and isolation, and we are naturally built, we are not where they're not as I say a person believe that they were created or they evolved. At the end of the day, we are social creatures. So this the problem still remain, and so social creatures that don't even want to talk to anybody, how are they going to function in a friend relationship or marital relationship or even work relationships? They're not going to function well. And so that's going to lead on to depression. So imagine the person is going to a doctor and they're saying, hey, look, you know, I need some help. I'm depressed. But one of the major so source of happiness is to be social. So th th there goes the problem. How do you fix that? Marijuana, coke, um, opiate, all that stuff. We can't fix that because you can't. Those things don't replace friends. Those things don't replace social relationships. So... 
a person struggling with a relationship, what they're really struggling with, which is social relationships. If you can't talk to me or I can't talk to you, it's not necessarily that like I'm going to have a great relationship with my spouse because sexual relationship does not replace social relationship. And so, again, and one not the other, the other doesn't fix the other. You know, relationship or companionship can make everything else go better. But if you have everything else, it doesn't make companionship work. So if you notice here, depression, but a lot of time that is one factor. And that can be a factor isolated in itself or that can be a factor caused by the bad relationship. It can be either or. It doesn't necessarily have to be just the person just, you know, depressed because they're depressed. They could be, you know, because they have been some type of mental issue. The mental issue could be caused by relationship problems. But how do you have a how do you have good relationships if, if so, no matter how friendly the person, if, even if the per person is from your your same people group, you still can't be friendly with them. That's the problem. As so all the drugs in the world are not gonna fix that. So relationship is one thing. Financial problems is another thing. Now you think about it again when we talk about the culture, the suicide and depression and the effect of the culture, the American culture. When you think about the culture again, it is it is this thing where we're in a consumer society. Now every everybody is a consumer. Every society consumes. That's what we do as human beings. We burn energy, so we get that from food. We wear stuff, we use stuff, everything breaks down and fall apart. But we have that hyper-consumerism and a lot of life, a lot of what life is all about is about material possession. And you take it hyper, because I say everybody deals with this, everybody wants a nice shoes, some clothes, somewhere to live, a car. Everybody wants these things. But when you take it to a level and then you make it become part of the culture with the movies and the, the um, everything, you know, uh, just every single aspect of the culture. It is hyper because it's one thing when you're outside of the culture, especially outside of the American culture, you watch it. It's fascinating to watch, but you're not living it. But when you're in it, you realize, wow, it is really part of the culture. It's the TV is not lying. And it's probably worse on the ground than it's even on the TV because it's real. You know it's real. So financial problems. So back to the article now. It says one big factor is complete. One big factor in completed um, suicide is having easy access to means. Firearms were involved in half of suicide, in part because a gun is very lethal. It's hard to save someone who has used a gun than to rescue someone from an overdose. So I pause there again. Now, this again is part of the culture. This is what I'm saying. It, it, you could say this and somebody outside the culture, somebody in the culture that is like immersed in the American culture. Uh, couldn't you get it? You know, if you talk to Americans, they're like, oh, no, no, you see, like, I'm going to tell you, there's a lot of Americans who probably read it, read this article. And the moment they came to that line, they just stopped reading. Because any mention of gun, they're like, oh, you know, they try to take away, gun, take away our guns. But the reality is just straightforward. It's not a left-right issue here. Uh, the reality is just lethal method. Method, You know, if somebody could jump off of a building, walk in front of a train, cut their throat. Uh, but in the county that I live, there's no tra trains and there is no major highway. You have to go into the other county to get a major highway. There's none. So you're walking in front of a tractor trailer is going to be reduced. Your um, walking in front of a train is going to be reduced. There's limited, very small amount of high rise buildings. So you're jumping off buildings going to. You know, the, the more lethal method is, in other words, I'm saying, is limited. But the one lethal method that is always plentiful, which is part of getting the culture, is a gun. And it's just the lethality of it, how lethal it is. So that's one thing. Then the lethal, 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 lethal thing that people have is, um, is uh, drugs. You know, there's a way to poison yourself. And um, that's something that's plentiful in our culture. Again, it's a drug. We have a drug culture. There's not a country in the world that uses drugs at the rate that we use. At least that's the last time I look at the number. 
We just use more drugs than anywhere else. It's just plenty of drugs, legal and illegal. So if you notice, thing, and that's all part of the culture because the moment the thought comes in your mind, the easy access to like get the job done right away becomes easy. And to do it little, because you could try various different things, but it's going to be difficult. You know, you, you would have to have a very sharp knife. Some of us don't. So what are you going to do? You're going to have to go out and go get a gun. So that's problem there. So notice again, it's just, this is part of the culture. This is, this is not bias. It's just, and this is what's weird about when people start getting to this defensive talk. Is that about if, 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 you know, it's left or right? It's just an issue of there's plenty of guns around. That's just the reality. And that's it. So notice here, removing the means can help. The CDC says another factor is lack of connectedness. So another factor is lack of connectedness. People are not connected. Loneliness is part of the culture. You know, I remember years back, somebody said to me, living in a city, in New York City, I was visiting someone. And they said to me, Lloyd, you know, I'm, I'm in a city. There's people all around me. And I'm lonely. This is years back. I remember the person said that to me and I'm like, yeah, okay. <laughs> but I don't know what they're talking about because it's, it's, there's people everywhere. There's people all around. How can somebody be lonely where you live in a city which is just millions and millions of people and they're close to you. You keep, you have to rub, rub on them literally where you go through even the streets sometimes. And I'm lonely and I'm like okay I'm out of here I don't know what you're talking about <laughs> I literally I was out of there and I don't know what they're talking about it took me years to understand that concept because I would think um, there's so many people you, you're in a metropolis but I come to realize it's just is and this was not a this was just, just anybody you just you can just get so lonely where there's so many people around. So no connectedness. People are not connected, no genuine relationships. And this has become part of the culture. It's, but it's very materialistic. Can you read it here? It says support um, supporting people at risk can help. Um, I have learned that it is important to talk about survivors' story. We know that so suicide is preventable. We think helping over we think helping overcome the isolation, helping to improve the connectedness can help. So it's important uh, to be connected with some people or to get connected with some people. The Substance Abuse and Mental Health Service Administration, Administration has a list of signs that may mean that someone is at risk for suicide. Risk is greater if behavior is new or has increased and if it seems related to a painful event loss or change and um, some of the things to note is that um, that is put out here by this organization it says ask them if they are thinking about killing themselves this will not put the idea into the head uh, into their head or make it more likely that they will attempt suicide so he's saying uh, somebody might think if you ask a person, are you thinking about killing yourself um, or committing suicide? That could make the person start thinking about it. But they're saying if a person is thinking about suicide, you ask them. Uh, it's not going to put the idea into their head or push them further. Uh, it, it is just to get somebody to talk. Listen without judging and show you care. Another point here is stay with the person and make or make sure the person is in a private, secure place with another caring person until you, you can get further help. Remove any object that could be used in a suicide attempt. And then most naturally, again, it says, call the National Prevention Suicide Prevention um, Lifeline at 1-800-273-8255. Or again, the other way to say it is 1-800-273-TALK. And follow their guidance. Um, if in danger, self arm seem eminent, call 911. And that would be for emergency care. So that's what's happening here. So that's kind of a, a update. As I say, you've heard so much about this recently because of those high profile cases that happened recently. And, but this is something that, as I say, you don't hear. I, 
try to talk a lot about this because I really believe this is um, ultimately suicide, depression, all these other things, isolation, all that is just part of the result of sin. But I really do believe that even the isolation is caused by the culture because we're in a culture where you're free to do what you want to do and to be left alone. But when you live in a little village, sometimes you might not see the amount of suicide, but people live lives that people, other people intrude upon. Very intrusive because you can't move without people tracking you. Um, but part of this culture is, you know, the concept of freedom, I believe, has helped push the idea of things like suicide and isolation, a lack of connective, connectivity, because, you know, you're free to be a freak and, um, and nobody will know anything about it. It's just part of it. So I'm going to go down to an opinion piece now. So this is an opinion piece written in USA Today by Chris, Kirsten Powers. And um, it's dealing with the same topic. It's titled, Americans are depressed and suicidal because something is wrong with our culture. Something is wrong with our culture. In September 2004, I received the call that, I remember this is an opinion piece that I'm reading here, right? So this is the lady speaking here. In September 2004, I received the call that every person dread my father had dropped dead at of, of a heart attack at the age of 61. It came at a time when I was already grappling with other issues, including watching my mother fight breast cancer for the preceding six months, a breakup with a boyfriend and a lack of structure in my life as I freelance as a consultant while I tried to determine what I wanted to do next with my career. I, I was in an emotional free fall, so I visited a psychiatrist. He said that the antidepressant my general practitioner prescribed to help um, with my lifelong struggle with anxiety wasn't what I needed. So he prescribed a new one. This seemed only to make things worse. Within a few days, I found myself thinking the unthinkable. I want to die. I couldn't imagine life without my father and our hour long, hours long conversation about, well, everything. The pain was debilitating. Getting out of bed was an Olympian event, and life was utterly devoid of meaning. I stopped eating and shed 15 pounds in a month. I couldn't see any reason to be alive. I've thought a lot about this period following the suicide of Kate Spade and Anthony Bourdain. Two people who by public appearance seem to be living their best lives. We also learned this week that suicide rates have risen by 30% since 1999, making it a national crisis. I decided to share my story after interviewing John Dapp Dropper, Draper, sorry, director of the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, who happens to be my future brother-in-law. What people don't really know is that there is research that shows that media can reduce suicide. Draper told me what create what creates a con a, a contagion effect is when the media focus mostly on suicide and the way the person killed himself. If people are more open about talking about coping through suicide experiences, the media analyzed those stories. The evidence is very clear that this has a very positive effect on getting people through a suicidal suicide crisis so it might help a person contemplating suicide to read that i am thankful i didn't succumb to my suicidal impulse or to learn that that people like Halle Berry, elton john drew barrymore attempted and survived suicide or that oprah winfrey olympian michael phelps and singer dami lavato um, consider suicide but didn't go through with it. We often assume that people who commit suicide are mentally ill, but this isn't always the case. There are many factors that can contribute to suicide that have nothing to do with mental illness, including loss of relationship, loneliness, chronic illness, financial loss, 
history of trauma or abuse and stigma associated with asking for help. Even for those who do ask for help, friends and family can be flummoxed by successful people planning their own deaths. And I'll pause there a little bit again. So um, I noticed there, I just want to list that relationship, loneliness again, chronic illness, financial loss, history of trauma, abuse, stigma associated with asking for help. So a person, and I've seen this before and dealt with this, a person who feels suicidal would feel, you know, bad about or not feel like they should be asking for help. And I think in the church, it can be even more, I don't know if it's more acute. It can be as acute as, I guess, I don't know if it's more. But in the church, I think you're supposed to be okay. You're supposed to be not lost. You're supposed to be saved. So how does a saved person turn to somebody and say, I feel like killing myself. Um, I need some help or I need to talk to somebody. It, it, it almost goes against the grain. And this is why I think even in the church, you see, individuals doing this and it can be traumatic because you're supposed to be saved you're supposed to be fine you're supposed to be doing well for yourself how then you're talking about suicide and i think that's where a lot of this is coming from and this is important as christians um to note that because as i say a person comes to the church and they're taught 20 something doctrines they're taught some prophecy but their life how to live, how to build relationships, how to be a better person. It's not really touched. You are automatically assume that you are a Christian because in some churches they have creeds. In some churches it's just doctrines. And so you come, you accept these doctrines, you're not baptized. But now the Christian virtues, how to overcome, how to grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord, Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. A lot of that is just ignored. It's just... You're, you're true because you accept these doctrines. And many people just don't know how to live because they still live in the American culture or whatever culture they're baptized in from whatever country. And so they're still... Um, and then this idea here of confession is just sometimes can be a very generic idea, confession of your sins. But this idea of accountability in confession, in confessing, you know, not just confessing, but being able to talk about and be open about one's struggles and one's weaknesses and stuff like that. We don't lay everything on the table for everyone, but just being able to have somebody you can talk to. I think this is often so detrimentally missing, terribly missing in the church. Uh, that's a side note. Back to this here. So, by again, so she says that a person who is successful asking for help can it can be strange. How do you... Because you normally we think the more successful is the less a person should be asking for help. My family and friends told me, back to the article, my family and friends told me I was living the dream and that I was too strong to succumb to suicide. Even my psychiatrist didn't take my complaints seriously, saying I didn't present a suicide. I didn't present as a suicidal person who was more likely to show up disheveled and unbathed than with a blowout and fresh manicure. So I can imagine she'll pause here again. I think that's important. So she goes to the psychiatrist and the psychiatrist say, well, you're bathed. You have a nice ear style. You're, you're looking good. You have your fresh manicure. You look, you look, you look fabulous. And imagine she lost 15 15 pounds so she probably just looked fabulous you know just great you're thinking wow your diet is working for you your hair look good your your your, your nails done you just look great but she's thinking suicide so that can be tricky and it's what i'm saying it's all in the mind so that's why unless a person open their mouth it could be that you don't know you just think the person is just trying to look good for the summer but they're losing weight because of the depression can you read in here? It says, never mind that the day before I had stood pressed against the 20th, 20th floor bathroom window of a building where I was consulting for a campaign, sobbing and wishing I could open it and jump to my death. Or that a few days before that, I had turned on the oven and put my head in, pulling it out only when an image of my younger brother's um also grieving my father's sudden death flash in my mind. So I guess she was going to guess herself. 
Despite my doctor's claim that nothing was wrong, I insisted that the cha that he change my antidepressant, and within a few weeks, my suicidal thoughts diminished. I've never known what that antidepressant. I never know. I never know whether the antidepressant was the cause of my suicide, the thoughts or not. What I do know is that every day I didn't kill myself. My um felt like a victory. Uh, though my suicidal thoughts pass and an oppressive um depression ground me down that year, life was an agonizing and daily struggle. So when I hear that Kate Spade was reported fighting depression and anxiety for five years all i can think is that it was nothing short of heroic for her to stay alive as long as she did and i might pause there because you know when dealing with health and health struggles whatever health struggles you're facing one of the hardest thing to do is to fight back and fight for a while uh, because the thing is, you realize this is this is something, it's either a genetic weakness, something you got from your parents, or a habit that you develop or was taught to you when you were young. And we, we don't, sometimes, I guess, we don't talk about it that you have to fight. And you have to sometimes, you know, it's have to be a hand-to-hand -hand mortal combat because the thing is trying to take you out. And you're trying to stay alive. And I think that's just the whole idea of life is that from we're born until we die, we're struggling for life. And sometimes, as they say, it could be mental the demons get to us or it could be a health issue and that get to us. So she was saying here that Kate Spade fought for five years. That's heroic. I mean, any health issue you're dealing with, just think about if she was dealing with cancer. And she fought, she went to the doctor, she did everything the doctors wanted her to do. She went and did natural health. She she just, she, by all means necessary, I fight for five years. You know, you still applaud that. Um, and why mourning the fact that she died that bad? Five years. Because many people succumb to their illnesses. They just basically give in and give up. And they just say, you know, what's the use? I'm going to die anyway or whatever. And they take that attitude. Some people fight back. And to me, that's just part of life. You know, why do we, why are we interested in natural health? Because we don't want to be sick. We don't want to die an early death. We don't want to make whatever weaknesses we have in our bodies overcome us because we are trying to figure out natural means and natural behavioral changes to overcome it. So if you're in a culture and the culture is, is has nurtured you to be a isolated person to be a lonely person to be a miserable person to be a person that's a complainer or whatever you know take on the fight say i'm not going to succumb to this this is not me and just fight back and just keep fighting until you either win the fight or you die but at least die trying but many people just say ah whatever and they end up on a bridge or they end up jumping off the bridge and you look at it, you you can imagine you know, there's a bridge and there's somebody on the bottom of the bridge just jumped off and there's a guy underneath the bridge. Two of them have succumbed. They just succumbed to whatever and they say, life has beat me so I'm going to give in. But you can say, hey, life has beat me, I'm going to fight back. And I've been in a situation where I had to fight back and people say, that didn't look pretty. I'm like, Psh, yeah, you're lucky I didn't fight back harder. Because you could give in and people are like, oh, no, you should give in because, you know, Jesus, you don't want to not, <laughs> you don't want to get all flustered and all angry and, and not look like Jesus. And I'm like, I'm going to survive. I don't know what you're talking about. Uh, Jesus whipped them um, or scourged them out of this, the synagogue. You know, sometimes you have to, you have to, you can't make them have you and whip you and beat you. Christ says, look, not yet. When it's my time, I'll submit to this. It's not right now. I have three and a half years. We're at year number three. Six more months to go. See you later. So, Kanji reading here, it says, What a lot of people don't understand is that the person contemplating suicide is overwhelming, um, is in a overwhelming emotional pain, and they think very differently than people who are rational. Draper told me, it's a cognitive construction. Your prefrontal cortex goes offline and you have a flight, f 
fight freeze or freeze impulse. In that case, suicide seems like the best way out of the out of or the best way to fight for your survival. They think maybe my afterlife will be better. But why are so many um more Americans get into this level of emotional despair than in the past. As a journalist, uh, Joanne uh, Harry wrote in his best-selling book, Lost Connections, uncovering the real cause of depression and unexpected solutions. Uh, the epidemic of depression and despair in the Western world isn't always caused by our brain. It's largely caused by key problems in the way we live. So notice here in the way we live. Now I'm going to just say this before I keep going with this gentleman's here um, concept. Uh, notice he had said that the frontal part of the brain get knocks off. You know, it, it comes offline. And then the person are thinking, you know, as a solution um, for that is just to kill myself and then probably the afterlife will be better all right i'm gonna come back to that thought just i'm just noting that here for you very important because this is part of the culture i believe that this article miss so in the large is a key problem in the way we live we exist largely disconnected from our extended families friends and communities except in the shallow interactions of social media because we are too busy trying to make it without realizing that once we reach that goal it won't be enough in an interview this year the, the, the comedian actor jim carrey talked about getting to the place where you have everything everybody has ever desired and realize you are still unhappy and that you can still be unhappy is a shock when you have accomplished everything you ever dream of and more. So you can imagine, you say, it's, it's shocking. I got it all and I'm still unhappy. If only we get that big raise or a new house or have children, we, f we will finally be happy. But we won't, in fact, as Kerry point, points out, in many ways achieving all your goals provide the opposite of fulfillment. It lays bare the truth that there is nothing you can purchase, possess, or achieve that will make you feel fulfilled over the long term. Rather than pathologizing the despair and emotional suffering that is rational, um, respond to culture that values people based on every on ever escalating financial and personal achievements we should acknowledge that something is very wrong we should stop telling people who yearn for a deeper meaning in life that they have an illness and need therapy instead we need to help people craft lives that are more meaningful and built on firmer foundation than personal success so um, i guess this is part of the culture that i'm not too familiar with so if a person say they need deeper meaning in life uh i guess she's saying here that people will tell you um you, you need help <laughs> you need to have your you have an illness you need therapy uh and but i can understand because this life can feel carnal vain vapid and uh if it feels like that simply she's saying here you probably go need some you need to try to build a more meaningful life and so but life is more built up where the society thinks it's the material possession it's not family friends and community notice as the gentleman said earlier family friends community these are all relationship but the society is a society that goes for material possession and success and the more it's getting it is the more suicidal the society becomes because again as i say the first time you read the bible and you start in the beginning of the Bible, you realize real quickly, that's a strange, every time I think about it, it's just so strange. Adam is lonely with all the material and everything possession he has. And you say, wow, why, why did God make us like that? We're made for relationships. And the society is anti-relationship because it's about more what you have and people as a matter of fact you can build relationships and this is always true for every society 
not just the American culture, I think we just take it to the next level. You can build, um, you, if you look at all culture, it's always that. you More, more money you have, it's more friends. More material possession is more toys, so more people want to play with you because you have the toys. And yet, this is can make a person even more depressed because everybody I have in my life, I bought them. So this is not good. So the, the flip of that is that we build on relationships again. It is just the stuff of life. We need that. So yes, there are people, back to the article, there are people who have chemical imbalance who should be supported and treated with medicine. But most Americans are depressed, anxious, and suicidal because something is wrong with our culture, not because something is wrong with them. Change in our culture is critical. Being honest with others about our own personal struggles and dark nights of the soul is the first step. People on the edge need to hear stories that assure them that there is a way through the all-consuming pain or to the meaningful, to a meaningful life. So she ends by saying she's told her story. Now go tell yours. So th this is something that I, I really um, see. And this, this, this is very interesting. An opinion piece. This is her, her opinion. She thinks uh, the culture that is built upon material possession and not the relationships. Um, it, it, it leads to a lot of, uh, what she say here, depressed, depressed people, anxious people, and suicidal people. Because what is the point of life? When we look at quite a few of the mass murders, um, even this issue with incel, I C, no I N C E L, these young men who are in the world but they feel like they have no real connection, relationship wise, and they feel like they need to go and kill some people, especially women. It's the same thing over and over again. It just the same problem, exhibit itself itself in different ways, uh, because the culture kind of tell you. You're good. You're the survival of the fittest. And you say, well, how are you surviving? And the person like, yeah, I'm winning. I'm c conquering Wall Street. I'm making all the money, but I want to kill myself. This is pointless. I have no friends. I build no relationship. And my life feels meaningless. And, but the society will tell him that he's winning. And he's the fittest. And then somebody said, no. See that guy there? He has a lot of friends, but he's broke. He's happy. And in many people in the culture, it is a baffling idea that somebody could be broken, be happy, and feel like their life has meaning. And the flip can be that you could be broken, depressed, <laughs> I have no relationship, and it's just double whammy. So it's important to contemplate this. And as it says, it's important, as you say, that the culture has to change. Changing our culture is critical. And you might not can change the national culture but the culture around you you can change where you start to value because the bible says a person that is that should have friends or will have friends will show himself friendly the bible doesn't say people need to show themselves friendly to you you need to be friendly and when you start being friendly you start to find that some most people will reject that friendliness and most people are suspicious if you're talking to them they're like wondering why are you talking to me but some people will affirm that, want that because they're craving that. And as you develop friends that are not destructive, you're going to find that that culture around you will start change. And you're going to start finding that meaning. So just really quickly here, I want to just talk before I, I finish up on these thoughts. That back to the idea of some people are depressed um, because something is going wrong in their brain. Um, although the author puts forth this idea that you know some people need medication, that could be uh, something that is needed in an emergency. I don't believe that there is some type of place for emergency. When there's a crisis, you hit the person with something to get them out of the crisis. Um, but on a day-to-day -day basis for day-to-day -day use, a person is not in a crisis, but they're experiencing some problem with their frontal lobe, their brain function. It's important for the person to seek out natural remedies, natural diets, get off the crazy diet with the crazy animals. If you look at the animals, animals, they look mad. They act mad. If you eat the diet that they're eating, you act mad and start looking mad. 
because the brain is being thrown off. So think about it. When you eat certain foods, the animals are being pumped with all these crazy chemicals to let them survive and live. Those chemicals have an afterlife. The life of the chemical doesn't end and get washed out of the, the animals. When you eat the animals, you're eating all that chemical. And the place that it's going to affect the most is going to be the brain. It's going to damage the brain. And some of these um, chemicals that are given these animals are chemicals that are similar to Ritalin and um, other mental psych psychoactive drugs. So to make the animals behave and act a certain way, especially before they kill them, uh, those chemicals are going to get in the food in your body. And it is not surprising that people are getting these chemicals in their system, not just by taking the drugs, they're eating the drugs via their food. And so all this crazy food would be one of the first thing a person need to do. That's part of the culture again. You know, this heavy meat eating and heavy chemical pesticide filled food. So it's important to get off that stuff for natural health and to eat the food that's going to make you feel good because remember part of our feel good is the food we eat. But some food can make you feel good but detrimental to your mental state long term ultimately. So the foods that are going to make you healthier is the more healthy, natural, plant-based food. Very important. So if a person says, Lloyd, I'm having struggles with mental health and it's both social and brain-wise or just brain or just social. Well, ultimately, if it's brain is involved there, you know, you want to start taking things like omega fatty acid, flaxseed, any type of seed nut that have omega fatty omega fatty acids. You want to take those into your system on a daily basis that will help your brain. Take other herbal remedies that um, will help the brain like ashwagandha, um, like holy basil, lavender. Any type of herbal remedies that is good to feed the brain, make the brain work better, make the brain sharper, make the brain has more focus and make you feel better naturally without the side effects. Um, these are herbs that you want to take and want to get part of your daily diet. Another thing that's important now is the social aspect, which is most of what we're talking about here this morning. Um, most people, as the article, the opinion writer wrote, most Americans are depressed, anxious, and suicidal because something is wrong with our culture, not because something is wrong with them. So most people, they're not suicidal, anxious, or depressed because they don't have enough omega fatty acid. I really believe you if you're suicidal and depressed and it's just the culture, getting a healthier diet will help. Right? It starts there. You have to start cleaning. Control what you can control the fastest. Getting some herbal remedies will help. Um, but separately from that though, it's, as I say, when the culture um, is a culture that is... Um, encouraging more materialistic more isolation think about it most people have left churches and the americans that do go to churches are people in america for the most part most of churches in america have become more uh, uh what you would call it a ceremony a lesser fellowship and that's where part of the problem is so even people go to church they go to church they're not interacting with human beings and if you say, if somebody said, well, how can the culture be like that? Because most of the time you see America on TV, they're in a stadium. But that's not meaningful. That's a spectator sport. That's not something that people are sitting, talking, interacting. If you look at in um, Acts, you see that when the Spirit of the Lord was upon them, they were fellowshipping. They were, they were studying together the same doctrine. They were um, fellowshipping, praying together breaking bread together there was something part of the result part of the result of the spirit of god upon us is that interaction increases amongst human beings when the devil is in charge isolation increases as you know that the intention of the devil is to isolate all of us and to destroy us one by one and yet we normally it normally starts us out in a social way so we do something social but often the social thing is really ultimately will get us isolated as you know many people go to bars and drink but they're very lonely 
many people will sit in a circle and use peyote or use marijuana. But ultimately, there's no relationship. The relationship is all around the drugs. If the, the peyote or the marijuana is removed, those people really don't connect with each other. The connection is the herb. So you find that where the problem is. So notice here there was no drugs. It was just they were fellowshipping. And whatever they did, they did it, but they did it in one accord in Acts. They prayed together. They ate together. They studied together. And they broke bread together. They ate together. Hopefully I didn't repeat myself. So that's the difference. And so we want to be able to build these type of relationships. So that when we're in the mind, when we're in a downward spiral, when there's sickness, there's death, there's financial loss, there's, say, addiction, there's anything that goes on that could happen to anyone. There's a divorce. These big events that could cause somebody to sink deep into depression, not because something is wrong with their brain, but because something went wrong. You have somebody that you can talk to. You have somebody that you can that guy can talk you off the ledge. Just imagine you're in a bind, you have no friends, and there's somebody that's talking you off the ledge that you don't even know. It might work and it works sometime. But just think about for how many people if they had a friend, they wouldn't even have to go on the ledge. They would just be talked off the ledge before they even go to the ledge. But the isolation leaves many people friendless. And this is just an accepted part of the culture that, you know, you do you, I do me, you stay away from me. I don't need you, you don't need me. But yet we're in a culture that people, in, in the most part, don't need each other. They don't interact with each other. They don't need friends, they don't need companions. But yet the suicide rate is so high. The depression, the anxiety is so high. Because, yeah, you, you, you might not need me in the sense that you don't need my money. And I don't need your money. I don't need your help per se. And I can suffer through by myself. But we are built to need something that we can't pay for. We can't pay for the connectivity or the connectedness. That's something that happened. It's an exchange that no money came. There's no Bitcoin to pay for it. There's no US dollar. There's no credit card. It's just something that you give because of love and because you care and because you need it. But yet the culture, you know, applaud itself for the idea that I can do without you. And there's no more community. There's no more village. We don't, so, you know, there might be something, some place that they call a village, but it's not a village. It's just people live in that area. And that's it. So that is has to be something that has to be addressed. And you might, as I say, can't change your community, but you can change part of it in the sense that you could have a community around you. Even if it's five people that you know, these are the people that I'm connected with and they're connected with me. And you look out for these people and that's what it is. But that has to be something that is going on in your life. You have to make a personal effort for this. But I've noticed the more isolated the person is, the more suicidal they are because they have nobody to talk to. And they talk to themselves in their brain. And after a while, they start to talk out loud by themselves because there's just nobody to connect with. But the connectivity has to happen. The connectivity can't be paid for because, as I say, Adam had, had it all and he was lonely. And so that tell me, you could have it all because somebody say, I'm going to become a multi, multi billionaire. And you see them all the time, they kill themselves because they have it all and they're still lonely. They have people around them all the time. They always have events, and but they're still lonely because, again, that the re true relationship is not something that money buys. It is something that you just give, and there's you can't see it. It's not something that you can write down and say you owe me this or you owe me that. It's just something that you, it's a it's a an exchange that can't be. It's not tangible. So it's important that that part of the culture has to be addressed. We don't have enough time. But I'll deal with more, more in the future. Let's pray. Our oh, Father, word we thank thee again for the blessings of this day. We thank you, dear Lord, for the relationships that you call us to on this earth, but ultimately the relationships that you want us to have with thee. May you bless us, dear Lord, and may we 
find thee and find love and love thee and love others as you would have us um, to do. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thanks again for being with me here on Revive Form Radio. Looking forward to talking to you live again tomorrow morning where we should do current events. Until then, I pray that you may continue to walk with the King. Mm -hmm.